one of the things that I would say about the Catholic Church is similar to a lot of other churches. They are working their way to heaven. And so they are more than willing to give. You know, whereas Baptist churches are already saved. They don't have to work their way to heaven. And their giving is on a different mental level. Okay? Okay? He doesn't understand why you say you're working your way through heaven. But this church, we work. The same well, church, everybody else. well, with with the Catholic churches, remember the canons that I gave you? The, the nine, they say that what Christ did was not all sufficient. Okay? In other words, they have to participate in their salvation. And that is bondage. The Bible never teaches that. But when you tell somebody that if you don't do the proper works, then you will end up in purgatory, which is what they teach, they are, that's why they're doing these things. It's because they're working their way in order to meet what Jesus was insufficient to meet. Do you see what I'm saying? The, the Baptist church holds to the Bible. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ's atonement is all-sufficient. It's not limited atonement. It is complete satisfaction of the penalty of the law. They don't teach that. The Council of Trent says those nine canons that out of the 20-some canons they issued say that what Christ did is not sufficient. And so when, whether people know that or not, that is the doctrine of the church, and that's what they're being told, is that what Christ did only gets you so far. And so your works participate in getting to heaven. What and he so, understand is we work too. But I was trying to explain to him that we, that we are saved for doing works, not saved by doing works. That's right. We're doing works, but the fact is that we're doing it out of an appreciation of what we have received. Okay? And if we don't do works, if we don't do diddly, it doesn't have anything well, to do with our salvation. Doing different than I have no idea. All I know is what their... I don't know what their works are. You know, I went to Catholic Church. Well, saying the rosary is a work. Right. Saying, uh, confessing sins is a work. Yeah. Those are things that you must do. You must do. The Mass, going to Mass, participating in the... Uh, continuing well, crucifixion the, crucifixion the continuing crucifixion of Christ. They say that every time you take the bread and wine, you are re-crucifying Christ. You are participating in His crucifixion. We say that is done. That is completely over. We are remembering what the Bible says. We are remembering His sacrifice. We are not participating in it. They believe in what's called uh, transubstantiation. This is the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ that you are eating. Okay, That's what they believe. Then you have a second, which is the Lutheran doctrine, which says consubstantiation. The elements are in uh, Christ is in the elements just like fire is in metal. If you put fire in metal, the metal gets hot. That's how it is. It's kind of waffling because he didn't want to get so far away he'd be called a heretic, but it really makes no sense. But they believe that they are actually participating in the crucifixion of Christ by taking the elements. Then you have a third one, which is Calvinism. It says that you are Christ is spiritually present when you take the elements. He is there with you and you're taking the elements. And then you have what we believe in Baptist churches, which is Christ is, uh, uh, we are, uh, we just said it. Um, uh, we're remembering. Yeah. We're, yeah, there's a term though that I'm not thinking of right now. Symbolic. symbolic. It is symbolic of symbolic. what, that's right. So you have transubstantiation, you've got consubstantiation, you've got uh, spiritually present or symbolic. And only one can be right. That's all there is to it. So what we have to do is determine, and where do we determine that from? Do we determine it from the canons? Right. Or do we determine it from the Bible? And the Bible says that Jesus held the bread in his hand. And he said, this is my body. And it must be symbolic. It, it must be because he said, this is my body. He's breaking the bread and saying, this is my body. And therefore, when you do this in remembrance of him, we are doing it that he is uh, symbolically being presented there. He's not spiritually present with you there. If two or three are gathered in my name, he's there anyway. It doesn't matter if we're taking the bread and wine or not. So the Bible has to interpret that. But that's what I'm saying. When I, when I use the term, they're working their way to heaven, it's only because of the doctrine of the church. I have no idea what those people believe. None. Okay, I'm not making an indictment on the Catholics in general. I'm making it on the Catholic teachings. Yeah, is my, that my, my college roommate, if she missed... Oh, if she missed Mass on Sunday, she, which, because she was ill or something, she really happened to, to confession 
because this was a confession of sin. Oh, sure. Yeah. How, how long has it been since you came to the confession? How long has it been since you've done this and that? And, you know, so... Full of things that, you know, full yeah, of all, all kinds of things like that. And that's what, you know, that's when I say they're working their way to heaven. It's because they believe that they have time coming in purgatory and they're working that off. By re and it says it right in the beginning of the Catholic Bible. I've got one at home. It says if you read the Bible this long each day, you get this many indulgences. And those are little tickets to get out of purgatory. And so that is literally working your way to heaven. Whereas we, when we read the Bible, we're doing it because we love Christ. We're doing it, and as I said, if somebody says, um, that one pastor that was here, and I, I shouldn't use the term knucklehead, but I called him a knucklehead. I said, um, uh, you know, he said, if, you, if you're not in the mood for reading the Bible, why would you read the Bible? Why would you force yourself? And I thought to myself, that is when we show obedience, is when we don't want to do something. Jesus Christ did not want to go to the cross. He wasn't like, take me now. He, he, he sweat in anguish over the, the coming cross. Father, if it's your will, not my will, but your will be done. Look at my hair standing up. So when we read the, the, the Bible in the morning and we say, oh, I just, I don't have time today, but I'm going to do it. I, or I, my head hurts and I do it. That is obedience. That is obedience. When we come to Bible study, there's uh, seven people here today. This is obedience. It doesn't mean that you should come and listen to me. It's that you are pursuing the things of God. Not because you have to or because you're going to get a ticket out of purgatory or into heaven quicker. But be So the works, the whole thing about the works is where is the cross? Is the cross here and you're getting up to it? Or is the cross here and you're working from it? That, that's the whole thing. And they are continuously working up to the cross. Continuously. Because it's not sufficient. It won't get them to heaven. Whereas we believe it already has. As it says in Ephesians 2.7. He has seated us in the heavenly realms with him already. And so that's why I use this terminology. But once again, I don't mean to get down on Catholics in general. Because I have no idea. I've talked to Catholics that go from great lovers of Jesus to they don't even know why they're Catholic. I've gone, I've talked to Catholics in all the spectrum, so I have no idea what individual Catholics know. All I know is what the doctrines of the church teach, that the councils that I handed you and the other things. So my, my indictment is not an indictment on the people. It's an indictment on what they hold as well, truth. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I think I would work Catholic in the <laughs> uh, But like I said... I mean, I challenged everything and got my little butt beat by the priest and up my father for challenging the priest. Right. And, you know, and why should you? Exactly. I confirmed because I didn't know whether I wanted to give myself the rest of my life to the Lord or not. Uh, I didn't know. Yeah, you had no idea. So you know, I, and I got to tell you, what you just said, it, it just, just popped into my head, but I don't know. In all honesty, if I would want to commit my life to the Lord, if what he did wasn't sufficient to get me where I wanted to go, why would I even bother? What would be the point? Now, like I said, well, I said if, this, if this life is all we have, then we're the sorriest people so, on Yeah, the we are to be pitied more than all people. So anyway, now we've got the 10% and the tithing out of the way. If you give 1 30th of what you make, and I'm talking not you in particular, because maybe you're giving 50%. Me, in the past couple months, I've given a lot less than I have in the past because I'm, I'm preparing for something in my life, and I won't go any deeper than that. But... Um, uh, Whatever you give, if everybody was to give one thirtieth, churches in America would be rolling in money. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I don't go by ties. I, I dislike the term ties. It's an Old Testament ter term. But if you preach ties, you better preach it properly. That's all I can say. If you preach ties, and I have never, never once in the hundreds of tithe sermons I've heard, never once ever heard it preached properly. And sometimes it's been actually twisted to the point where it doesn't even resemble what the Bible says. And that was David Jeremiah, and that's why I don't listen to him anymore. It's all about money. Anyway. Um, uh, on that. What's that? Oh. About the tithing and all that. Yes. And give it to the church. Like the military, I always told my people, every time you get a pay raise, take that pay raise and put it in savings. Right. Because if you live without that pay rate before you can... Then you pay certainly pay. live without it after. And that's what we kind of live by every time we get a pay rate. Give it to the church. And you know what? That, that is what I was saying about the companies. I've heard of people 
that will start at 10%, they just a baseline, they pick up uh, an amount they're gonna give, and they start giving, and as their company grows, they just give more of their income until they're up to 90% of what they make, giving it to the church. And that is the people that are funding the churches because the other people that aren't giving anything are giving empty envelopes. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> well, you know, you have to look at that also. It could also be, like you say, it could be someone that feels embarrassed that they That's right. have the yeah. money. And we only have it once in a while. But, and, and, and they just don't want it in. people to yeah. know they don't have the money. That's right. You know, and, they, and they feel bad. I mean, it's, So it's the bad. reasons are totally, to there, there's a million reasons why people do what they do with money. That's one of them. I heard, I, I'll give one more an example of it. Rory doesn't want to hear any more tales, I'm sure, but. Um, uh, you uh, it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's a. Uh, uh, there's one guy, I think it was at a Methodist church, that every week he was like the wealthiest person in town kind of thing, and he would hold up his envelope every week like this, and when the plate would come, he'd set it down in there, and they said he gave five bucks every single week. That was all he gave. So, you know, whatever. If that's what it's worth to him, then that's what it's worth to him. And, you know, I struggle with this, but at the same time, there are other things that we give to Christ that may not be church-related. Okay, so people shouldn't be thinking, if I don't give it to the church I'm attending, I'm not doing my, I know. Pastors though preach that. Oh, yes, they do. This is your church, and yeah, it does me too, because there are other Christian entities. There's, you know, Angie, that, that girl that, uh, uh, you know. And you got Samaritan's Purse. You got all these. Right. Those are Christian organizations that you give to, and what you give you know, anyway. It's to the glory of God, so. That's right. That's right. So, you know, the, the thing about the church is churches need to have a certain amount of money. And if that church isn't meeting its goal, then they should stand up like, I think Seth did that. You know, somebody last year said, you know, this is what we need. Coming We're at the end of the year. And I got to tell you, I love when they do that because they're being honest about the finances and they're saying, we need help, right? And. I, I won't go anymore because there's something, yeah. Anyway, okay, so here we are. That, all that talking about tithing based on Abraham giving him a tenth. It was, pre, it was descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, so let's go all the way through um, uh, chapter 7 of Hebrews real quickly because we're still talking about Melchizedek, and then we're going to go back to your verse 9, and you had a question about eternal salvation. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and indeed those who are of the sons of Levi as I said, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive the tithes from the people, according to the law that is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham blessed, and blessed him who had the promises. Now, real quickly, here's what he's saying, is that here you have Levi, and then from uh, Levi was Israel or Jacob, and then from Israel was his father was Isaac, Okay, and then from Isaac was who? Abraham. Okay, and what he is saying, and I've used this in other instances for proving that we're all in Adam, but here it says that Levi receives the tenths from the people of Israel. So here's the people of Israel as a whole, and what they do is they give 10% to Levi. Okay, and then Levi gives that money through his father, through his father, through his father to Abraham. And Abraham gave that 10% to Melchizedek. So the people of Israel are technically giving their 10% to Melchizedek. See how great Melchizedek is. That's what he's saying. He's saying, these people are receiving the 10th. They're giving it up to him. And therefore, that shows the greatness of Melchizedek. The Abraham, before they were even born, because they're in Abraham, gave, them a gave him a 10th. It's saying that he is greater than than Levi, who receives the tenths from Israel. Do you see that? And that goes back to this one. The Levites were at the time of David. This guy is greater than the Levites, and he has an eternal priesthood. So, um, it says here, uh, uh, verse 7, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So, Melchizedek is greater than, Mel than uh, Abraham. But if Melchizedek is greater than Abraham... And Abraham is greater than Israel, and Israel is greater than Levi, okay, then obviously this person, Melchizedek, is greater than all of them. You see that? He is greater. That's the point he's making, is that Melchizedek is, uh, is blessing Abraham. Abraham is greater than all of them, and therefore 
Melchizedek is greater than all of them. Yes, that's correct. Anyway, so it shows the greatness of Melchizedek. Then it says, um, here, mortal men, Levi, receives the tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Melchizedek is not recorded as having died, and therefore he lives forever. 